welcome back to the workshop. I'm really excited to show you this project. This might be one of my favorite pieces I've ever made. It's a walnut sideboard with two sliding doors with a Kumiko panel on the front and three drawers with inlaid handles. This sideboard took a very long time to make and I hope this video can convey everything that went into it. I had to cut a lot out, otherwise this video would be 10 hours long. But I show all the key bits and hopefully this narration will help paint the picture for you. On the topic of build videos on YouTube, do let me know in the comments down below whether you like full build videos where the whole project is shown in one video or whether you like a build to be separated into multiple videos. So then you have more parts but you can go into a bit more detail in each process. I think one big issue woodworkers have when showing their work on YouTube is trying to convey how long something takes. For example, a build could take a month to make, but it can be condensed down into a 10 minute video. So it's pretty difficult to show the viewer how long a specific process takes or the build in general. I think a project is more impressive when you know exactly how long it takes. A huge part of making bespoke pieces is the design time. And when people watch videos on YouTube, they just see you know, the final build video. However, before you even get to the build stage, there's often many weeks, sometimes months of designing. And with a lot of my pieces, I talk to my client to understand exactly what they want, what features they would like in their piece. And we normally go through a few iterations until we fall upon the final design. Designing is often a two-way thing between the maker and the client. Everyone has different tastes. I could design, in my opinion, a perfect piece of furniture, but the client might not like it. So you definitely need to understand your client's tastes and what they want. And that will save a lot of design time because you won't be wasting time designing lots of pieces that your clients don't like. So long time viewers of the channel will have guessed I am veneering the panels, which will give me perfectly flat panels to create the carcass from. And to joint the constructional veneers together, I use my Axminster planar thicknesser. When you're using thick, high quality constructional veneers, this is a really easy way of creating a flat edge on a piece of veneer by running it over the planer. I glued down a board on the planer bed to push the veneer up against the fence. This allowed me to get a 90 degree cut. One of my viewers on a previous video told me they use a track saw to join constructional veneers. Now I haven't tried this method, but I think that's a really good idea. Especially if you want to join multiple veneers at the same time, you can pile up a stack of veneers, put your track saw track on and cut a clean edge. It's definitely something I want to try next time. Once the panels were glued up, I cleaned up the edges on the table saw and with a track saw. Before I glued the cabinet together, I needed to cut the sliding door track. I used a dado stack to do that as I could dial in just the right size, which is slightly larger than the sliding door. Once the sliding door track was cut, I kept the dado stack in the table saw. I cut a rebate joint on the back of each board for the back panel to be inserted into and also cut a rebate joint on the ends for the side panels. I used a domino jointer for the internal walls. And once all the joiner was cut, I decided to sand all the panels. It's a lot easier doing it now than when the cabinet is glued together. Otherwise, it would be a lot harder sanding those internal corners when the cabinet is glued up. With most of the panels I made, the trim I added was walnut to match the veneer. But you'll notice on the two internal walls of the cabinet, the outside trim I used maple. And that is so it blends in with the drawer fronts and the sliding doors. I wanted the whole front panel of the cabinet to be maple. And if I had walnut trim there, it would look really out of place. If you haven't noticed, I used the planar thicknesser in every single one of my projects. If you haven't got a planar thicknesser, I highly recommend getting one. It will allow you to machine all types of wood to any thickness you want. And it will save you a lot of money in the long run from buying pre-machined wood online. It's a lot cheaper buying rough sawn boards from a timber yard and then machining them up yourself to get the exact thickness you want for any component of your piece of furniture. And it's a lot quicker instead of going online, paying someone else to machine up boards for you, which is a lot more expensive and a lot more time consuming. I have an Axminster spiral head planar thicknesser. I've had it for a few years now and I still haven't rotated those carbide teeth. 
because if you didn't know, on carbide teeth there are four cutting edges. So on a planar thicknesser, when the edge finally gets dull, you don't need to replace the tooth, you just need to rotate it 90 degrees and then you've got a new cutting edge. People say carbide teeth last 10 times longer than standard planar thicknesser straight knives. And if you think about it, there's four cutting edges, so they technically last 40 times longer. So these carbide teeth will probably last me over a decade. I use Blum Blue Motion soft close draw runners. These are undermount draw runners, and I think they are so much better than standard draw runners. It sets your work apart from the rest, and I think it makes it look really high end. When you open a drawer and have runners on the side, it's a bit ugly seeing that metal there. So these undermount drawer runners are always hidden and gives the effect that the drawer is floating. I was also surprised to find out that these runners can take a weight of 30 kilograms, which is ridiculous. No one is going to be putting that much weight in the drawers, but it's good to know that these are heavy duty enough uh, to take whatever you want to put in it. For the drawer front, I glued on a lovely sheet of curly maple veneer. While I was making the drawer fronts, I was wondering how I'd actually glue it onto the drawers. I didn't want to screw them from the inside of the drawers as I didn't like the look of that. But most importantly, I wanted the reveal around the drawer fronts to be equal all the way around. So I used playing cards and I stacked them up and placed them around the drawer front to make sure the gap was consistent. But I still had the issue of how I was going to clamp the drawer front on. I couldn't bring the drawer out and use a clamp because the playing card trick then wouldn't work and I wouldn't know if the drawer front was in the right position but I remembered I was inlaying handles at the end. So I thought where the handle was gonna go, I could add temporary screws to clamp the drawer front on. These screw holes would later be hidden when I inlaid the handle in place. So for this project, I used the CNC three times. The first time was creating a leg template that allowed me to use a flush trim bit to achieve a perfect arc on the bottom of the rail and a lovely taper on the legs. I also used the CNC to cut a flush trim template for the handles. This allowed me to use a flush trim router bit that hogged away all the material to insert a handle in. And finally, I cut the walnut handles on the CNC. I love using the CNC to inlay handles because you get a perfect fit and it's a style I really like the look of. These handles were a lot of fun to make. I cut very small rebates and grooves on the router table and I machined up a thin strip of wood to glue into that rebate. This will give your fingers a little lip to grip onto when you're pulling open the drawer. I rounded over the edges so they were nice to touch and I sanded everything before I glued it together. For the drawers, I decided to make the handles out of walnut as a contrasting wood instead of using maple to match the veneer front. You may have heard the phrase, if you can't hide it, accentuate it. And it's very similar with these handles. I felt if I inlaid a light wood maple handle into the veneer drawer front, the colour wouldn't match perfectly and it would really highlight that inlay. It'd make it look like you were trying to hide it, but you couldn't. So I spoke to my client and I suggested it would be a good idea to use a contrasting wood for those handles and turn it into a feature. And now I think the handles look fantastic and really create a new design element for the piece. Now one of the benefits of me filming some of my build videos is I can look back at some of my past videos and remind myself how I made them. And it's so important if you ever get a new commission of a piece you've already made to have records on how you did it. The first time you make a piece is always the slowest time and the next one you make is even faster. But if you don't keep records of how you did it, you're basically starting afresh. So if you get a commission of a piece you've already made, it's really good to keep those jigs and templates and any sketches and measurements you used because it will really help speed up the next time you make it. If you're new to woodworking, you probably hear everyone complaining about sanding, saying it's the worst part of your project and no one likes doing it. However, people might not enjoy it, but it's actually probably the most important part of a project. You can have perfectly fitting joints, but if the surface of your piece of furniture is really rough, then it's just not gonna give an impression of high quality and it just won't look nice. And then the finish you put on top of the wood after will then be rough and not perfect. The first thing people do when they look at your furniture is run their hands all over it, feeling the tabletop and feeling how smooth the legs are. And if you haven't sanded the piece of furniture perfectly, it is really easy to give a bad impression. And that is the number one difference between high-end pieces and low-end pieces, is the quality of finish. 
So it doesn't matter how nice of a finish you have, the substrate that you're putting the finish on has to be prepared perfectly. So I always recommend sanding well and sanding in all the areas. I sand the underside of a table just as much as the tabletop. The sander I use is the Festool ETS 150 sander. I absolutely love it. The sandpaper I use is Rubin 2. If you didn't know, Festool have a wide range of sandpaper. The Rubin 2 is just for sanding wood. If you do wood and epoxy work, you would want something like their granite paper. And that is a lot more expensive. So if you're just doing woodwork, I'd recommend Rubin 2, which is the cheaper of their sandpaper, but it is just as good. It's just cheaper because it just sands wood. I often sand a whole piece of furniture just using one sheet of each grit. The reason the Rubin 2 sandpaper lasts so long is because I use it with the Festool ETS sander. And that pad has what Festool calls a multi jet stream system, which creates the best dust extraction on the market. And when you have good dust extraction, the sandpaper lasts longer. Not only is there air being sucked up into the extraction, there is also air being blown out. And that encourages the sawdust to be directed into the extraction holes. And that in turn cools the pad down and cools the sandpaper down. The biggest cause for sandpaper wearing out quickly is it heating up. And with the jet stream system, the sandpaper lasts longer because the pad is constantly blowing cool air onto it. The leg posts were too thick to cut in one pass on the table saw. So I had to cut halfway through with the table saw, trim it off with a bandsaw, and then use a flush cut bit in the router table to trim off that remaining area. Once the leg blanks were shaped, I measured the distance in between them and I cut some rails to size. The leg base is made from solid black American walnut to match the veneer and also dominoed this leg base together. Once all the domino joints were cut, I dry fitted the frame together to place a CNC leg template on. I traced around the profile with a sharpie so then I can rough cut it on the bandsaw. Cutting these tapers on the bandsaw is a very old technique and this method of rotating the block 90 degrees was traditionally used with Chippendale legs and Queen Anne legs. This is a much more modern version with just a simple taper instead of that traditional ball and claw S-shaped leg. It's a lot of fun cutting these 3D shapes on the bandsaw. I've been very careful to cut just outside of the line because later I'm using that template to use a flush trim bit to get the perfect edge. I secured the template on with just masking tape and O3A super glue. This allows me to temporarily glue that template on for all the machining and then after I'll be able to remove it without damaging the leg base. Now I was contemplating for a while how I'd glue up the leg frame because at the time I didn't have a clamp long enough. I needed a clamp that would stretch the full length of the sideboard but I didn't have one of those F clamps but I thought a strap clamp would work. So I used two strap clamps which wrapped all the way around the leg base. It has a ratchet on it which I did up tight and actually pulled all the joints in very tightly and it worked perfectly. Things that will set your work apart from everyone else's is the little details you add to pieces. When I was designing this piece, I knew I wanted to add some sort of detailing to the leg base to make it stand out, but I didn't know what yet. If I left the faces plain, it would look good and modern, but it wouldn't have the wow factor in my opinion. I started looking for router bits I could use to create some sort of beading on the edges, and I found this huge cove cutter on Axminster. I realized this cutter would give me a really nice detail on that inside edge of the leg base. This cutter is huge and you can't use it with a handheld router, you have to mount it in the router table. And that posed a bit of a problem with the long side of the leg base. I had to move the router table to the other end of the workshop where the ceiling is a bit higher so I could turn the leg base on its side so I could route out that small side of the leg base. I just had enough space to create that molding. However, if it didn't fit in my workshop, I would just take my router table outside and I have to cut it outdoors. But you can see now, just using that one Axminster cutter has elevated this leg base now and creates a really eye-catching detail. The sideboard is broken up into two sections, the main cabinet and the leg base. I did this for a number of reasons. Firstly, it's easier to transport and when I get to my client's house and it'll be easier getting around corners and through doorways. To join the leg base onto the cabinet, I use threaded inserts. 
I created some wooden brackets that I mortised in place. These have a hole in which the bolt can be threaded through, securing it onto the cabinet. Threaded inserts are a great way of securing two components together, as you'll be able to take the bolt in and out of the insert as many times as you like, unlike a wood screw, which will wear over time. my veneering I use type bond cold press glue for veneer. This isn't the only glue you can use, you can use standard wood glue but the cold press glue for veneer is the perfect glue to use because it's thin enough to get a really thin film of it however it does have thickening agents so when you put the veneer onto the panel the glue thickens and it doesn't seep through the grain. If you've ever done veneering in the past and you hadn't used the right glue you may have found after you glued the panel that glue has seeped through the veneer and you get shiny glue spots. That is really difficult to get out through sanding and using type one cold press glue eliminates all that glue squeeze out through the pores of the wood. It also sets really quickly in the press. It says on the bottle that the dry time is anywhere from half an hour to two hours. So you don't need to wait overnight for your panel to have cured. You can pop it in, work on something else and then take it out the bag in an hour or so and you can get working again. Now it's time to make the Kumiko panel. I saw this style online of creating this pattern using the table saw. I thought this pattern matched the sideboard perfectly. It's very square and geometric. I had to create a few table saw jigs to make sure I was cutting the half lap joints in the perfect location to create this grid pattern. It was really fun cutting out all the pieces and gluing them together. I used the disc sander to create a taper on all the small pieces. And I think that tiny detail of creating those tapers really made the Kumiko pop. Speaking about the disc sander, that is my newest sander I've got in the workshop. It's funny because normally when you start out woodworking, a disc sander is one of the first machine sanders you buy. But the first one I got was the belt sander, then next was the drum sander, and then a bobbin sander. Now I finally have got the disc sander, which I probably should have got right at the beginning. But I have found it to be so useful. I'm using it all the time to sand small, intricate pieces of wood, if you're interested in any of the tools I use, they're all from Axminster Tools. A link will be in the description down below. And if you want to help support the channel whenever purchasing tools on Axminster, I'd really appreciate it if you go through that link in my description. That link just takes you to Axminster's homepage and I'll let them know I sent you and I'll get a small cut of your purchase with no extra cost to you. And I want to thank all the people that have already used my affiliate link, it really does help. Even though I cut most of the pieces on the table saw, there was still a lot of hand work involved, cross cutting each segment to size with a hand saw, fine tuning the rebates with a chisel, and of course, a lot of hand sanding. pieces I added to the grid work, the more rigid it became. I had to apply very small amounts of glue because I didn't want any glue squeeze out to show up, which would then be very difficult to remove at the end and would be visible in the final result. So I was applying the glue with a toothpick and applying very small amounts in each joint. I think I've been saying rebate joints, but actually these are housing joints. The difference are when a groove is cut in the middle of a board, it's a housing joint. And when this groove is cut on the edge of a board, it's a rebate. This process was very time consuming, but very enjoyable. I had a podcast on in the background. Doing this type of work is quite a nice change because often I'm wearing ear defenders and using very loud machinery. So for this stage of the build, I took the ear defenders off. I had some music and a podcast on in the background and I could just quietly do this in peace. <laughs>
Once the Kumiko panel was glued up, I added a trim around the outside. This wasn't only to stiffen it up, but that gave me more material to glue onto the sliding door. I ran it through the drum sander to make sure it was perfectly flat and added a dextro chamfer around the edge. I added very small dabs of glue on the Kumiko, again, because I didn't want any squeeze out when I glued it onto the sliding door. I also inlaid handles onto the sliding door, but I didn't add a lip on these handles like I did on the drawers. As the motion of sliding the doors from left and right, it didn't need the lip, but with the drawers you need that lip to pull it outwards. To finish the sideboard, I use Rubio Monaco. I use their Pure, which works perfectly with Walnut. It really enriches it and darkens it to a very nice color. And it also really highlighted the ripples in the curly maple. I applied the Rubio with a buffing pad on my orbital sander. This really helped work the oil into the grain and apply it very evenly. In all the hard to reach areas like the handles and the Kimiko, I applied the oil by hand. So after many hours, the sideboard is fully complete. I'm absolutely thrilled with it. Please let me know what you think about the build in the comments down below. I hope you enjoyed this build video. Remember to let me know in the comments down below if you like longer full build videos or shorter multiple part build series. So thank you for sticking to the end of the video. If you enjoyed it, make sure you give it a like. If you're new to the channel, feel free to subscribe and I'll see you very soon for the next video.